All right, everybody, welcome back to the Vertical Church Podcast, episode 25. If you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing that we have a guest with us, Ron Guess, who's coming in to fill in for Desi, who decided vacation sounds awesome, and it does sound awesome. So we hope he enjoys his time away. We miss him, but we're super excited for you to join us uh, as we talk about vertical values and maybe even just a little bit about what stuck out to you, what excites you, and then go over the three values for this week as well. Um, so let's dive in. The first vertical value that we covered uh, that we want to talk about today is called sharp swords. Yes. Sharp swords, and that kind of comes out of Hebrews 4.12 where it mm -hmm. tells us the Word of God is alive and active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And we just believe so much that the Word of God is alive and active, but it also deeply applies to our life here. So, Ron, you know, maybe the listener out there goes, that's kind of bizarre language. You know, what, what do you mean that the Word of God's alive and active? So, is there any experiences in your life that you can kind of tell a story on or maybe give an example to someone of, of what does it mean for the Word of God to be alive and active? Sure. Well, to me, <clears throat> I've always looked at the Word of God. When I take Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, uh, for myself, I've always looked at it as a very penetrating in instrument that goes down to the very... Uh, soul and the very spirit of who God created me to be. I think of one story in particular. Years ago, after I retired, I was working for Publix as a bag boy, and God had given me a very uh, successful ministry there. People knew that I was a lay chaplain, and uh, many folks were coming there, and uh, the uh, uh, manager gave me the liberty to pray for people in line, to encourage them, to pray for them in the parking lot. And it was just a very fruitful season, a very fruitful ministry. But one day, one morning, I was coming into work, and um, and as I was coming in, I always looked up at the sign of Publix, and uh, I would see a little bird's nest in the pea up there, and I was looking at that, going through my normal routine, and the Lord spoke to me in a very clear way. And he said, your time here is finished. <clears throat> that's, that's pretty and clear. I, very clear. And I said, no, I don't think so, Lord. I said, I, I, I said Lord, is that really you? And so I thought, Ron, is this of you or is this really of God? And uh, so what I did was I said, now, Father, if this is really you, I said, now, I, I've got to know what you. I said, I don't trust myself. So I trust you, but I don't trust myself to, uh, that I'm hearing correctly. So I said, if, if this is really you, I said, you're going to have to speak to me through the word. I said, because I've got to have some clarity on this. And immediately the scripture in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. I said, all right. And then I knew I was supposed to resign that day, but I did not. Mm. And uh, so I put it off uh, for several weeks. And then the manager and I, uh, it was a new manager, and uh, he did not give me the same grace as the previous ma uh, uh, manager for my uh, ministry. And so he and I started having some issues. And uh, in, in uh, one day in particular, it had uh, uh, gone to a level where we were confronting one another. And in our office, or rather in his office, I said, you know, this is not a problem with you. This is a problem with me. And he said, how so? I said, God told me I was not supposed to be here any longer. And I disobeyed the Lord. And I said, the reason we're having this trouble is not because of you and your management. It's because of me and my disobedience. I said, so I'm resigning as of today, not because of what you've said or anything you've done. I said, but because of what the Father told me to do. And uh, so um, uh, upon doing that, uh, and on my last day, a dear lady came up to me. And she said, um, Ron, I want to give you a tip. In Publix, uh, bag boys can't take tips. I said, well, I, I can't do that. She said, well, you're going to do it. She gave me a $25 tip. But she said, but I also have something uh, for you from the Lord. I said, okay. She said, it's from the Word. I said, okay. And she said, this is God's Word to you from the Scripture. I said, okay. And she said, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, He will direct your path. And that way, God, through his word, through the first time he spoke to me, and then on the second time through the confirmation of his word, I knew absolutely that I was doing the will of God according, not to my feelings, but according to his word. That's so good. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, let's talk a little bit, you know, also about, you know, our time with the Lord and being in the word. We really encourage all of our listeners to be in the word daily. Yeah. You know, we really feel like that's one of the clearest ways for God to speak to us. And, you know, one of the things... 
um, that I'll just share with you about how I read the word if you're listening right now is is I just always ask the Lord, like, well, won't you please speak to me? You mm-hmm. know, before I start reading, and I, I usually only read a couple chapters a day. So, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not, you know, as a pastor, I'm not reading like hours and hours and hours upon the scripture. And so, you know, when I go to read my couple chapters today, because I, I try to read through the Bible in a year, and so I just follow the plan. But I, I always ask the Lord, won't you please, you know, just kind of speak to me, but also help me, uh, ha- help me see this, but also use it to conform me to be more like Jesus. Yeah. And so I'm asking when I'm reading it, like, I don't want to just read it like I'm reading a book, but I'm asking God, won't you please just use these to change who I am to be more like Jesus? Yeah. And and I believe that that's happening. You know, if you go read John 1, you know, you're going to see some correlations there between the scripture that, that's kind of highlighting why the word of God is alive and active. The word became flesh. Yeah. And so well, I don't want to get into a whole theological rabbit trail, sure. but but that's one of the reasons is, is the word of God can absolutely um, be used to help transform who you are mm-hmm. and your actions. It can be used to transform how you think mm-hmm. and see things. And so if you're out there, I would encourage you just start reading through the gospel. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just read one chapter a day if you're not in the Bible at all mm-hmm. right now. And just every time you go to read that one chapter, ask the Lord, won't, won't you just reveal things to me? Won't you speak to me? But also help this um, to just help me be more like Jesus. And I promise you, as you read through that over time, you're going to see stuff stick out to you. You're going to see things happen. And um, I would encourage you to journal as well. Mm-hmm. You know, write down the verses that stick out to you. Write down the time and date and things, and, and you're going to be encouraged to be able to go back and read those. Amen. So so what would you encourage our listener to do, you know, if your experience of following and being in the Word, you know, maybe they're having a hard time reading it. It's just um, you know, maybe either being consistent or they're not feeling like things are sticking out of them, what would you encourage them with? You know, um, for my own self, I, I, I tend in my reading every day, I always read the uh, uh, chapter of Proverbs that corresponds to the day. I also read a chapter in Ecclesiastes, and, and like yourself, I've read through the Bible many times, and I tend to read through it over and over and over again. And that's what I currently do, though I, I'm not following a plan, but it's just it's just the way that I read. Um I think the thing that transformed my life, the way that um, uh, I read uh, the Word of God and as I uh, uh, think about the Bible, is first I pray before I read. Mm. And I say, Father, I said, um, I need to hear you. And, uh, but I understand uh, that when you gave your son, it was to where I could have this relationship with you. And the only way I can hear you is by you're speaking to my heart, but I believe you do that through your word as he's done so many times. So I try to remember each time that I go into uh, a season every morning of reading the word, I go in there with the attitude that God paid a great price for me to have this privilege. And I say, you, I, I say, Father, you promised that your uh, spirit would lead and guide me to all truth. And I pray that you'd open my heart, not to see what you're saying in the Bible, but to see you in the Bible mm. and to see the Word of God. And I make it a personal experience, just like I'm sitting down talking to you right now. That's good. Mm. So I really hope, you know, this kind of encourages our listeners, you know, just be willing to apply that. Be willing to try that. I can promise you the one way to not see the Bible's alive and active is to not be in it, you yeah. know. So right. And so I would encourage you, just get in. You get just, you know, there's not a right or wrong amount to be reading Mm -hmm. unless you're not reading at all that's the wrong amount yeah if you're reading zero um and so there's not like hey you have to read this many chapters to be holy or this kind of thing yep just be consistent being in the word and i promise you it's going to see you know a return in your life amen uh over time for sure so uh another you know vertical value that we went over in the sermon was bodybuilders Mm -hmm. and it was just talking about how we really want to encourage and have unity inside of our own church but we also want to build up other churches and you know this is kind of a a consistent theme throughout our values of this has got to be bigger than us yes and so you know ron what would you say after your experience in church why unity is important inside of a church even you know why is that important for churches you know i think what you say is very profound um, particularly for the day in which we live and even since the inception of the church god's intent i believe was for us to be at unity with our own fellowship but also to be in unity with the other churches mm-hmm. uh, we may not always agree, do- agree doctrinally on some things but the thing one thing we can agree on is we serve the same god we serve the same savior jesus 
And um, I, I think of a scripture in Ephesians 5 where the Bible is talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. But uh, there's something in there that the Lord says through the Apostle Paul. He says, um, uh, no man hates his own body, but he loves and cherishes it. And I see the church and our local uh, fellowship, our, our local assembly here, as an extension of the whole part of the body of Christ. We're one member of the whole body. And so I don't try to, uh, I look at the other churches as an extension of the body of Christ, of which uh, we're one member and they are a member. So I look at it much like a, like a, my eye. Uh, I might be the eye, but I'm looking out for the foot and I'm looking out for the hand. And uh, so when I look at the other churches, I'm looking to do whatever I can as God moves me to be an encouragement and uh, to encourage them that I'm with them. I'm not against them. And uh, we're, we're serving a common savior and we have a common goal to spread the gospel. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things I talked about in the sermon was just kind of encouraging people to pray for other churches, even if you drive by them. Yeah. You know, drive by, pray for that church, pray for their pastor. You know, I really want to encourage people to be doing that. There's a lot of um, pastors right now in the ministry who are discouraged. Yeah. There's people who are either retiring just because it's, it's that time. You mm -hmm. know, they, they've served the Lord faithfully. It's time to retire. Um, or just 2020 with COVID and, and the political nature of last year, just it was too much. Mm -hmm. um, and people are getting burned out and we're losing pastors. And it, it's not healthy for our body um, to be having a lot of churches without a pastor, yes. you know, and so just be praying for other churches, Amen. Uh, pray for other pastors. And we're not just saying that because it, it sounds nice or anything. Yeah, we really feel like it's what it's called to do. I mean, you, you think about Jesus, one of his last prayers on this side of eternity, when the last things he really prays for is let them be one. Yeah. He's praying for the unity amongst believers. That's right. And my goodness, if Jesus says, Hey, one of the last prayers I get to pray, I'm praying you'll be one. I would think Jesus knows what's about you, yeah. what, what's kind of important for us. And mm -hmm. unity, not just inside of our, our church here vertical, but all bodies like you're talking about is so important for us to accomplish what the Lord wants us to do. Because again, you know, in Jesus, one of his earlier prayers, when he's asked how to teach us, <clears throat> when they, they asked Jesus how to teach us how to pray, one of the first things he says is, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done. Yes. And so when you see that, when Jesus is teaching one of the most important things in our prayer, it's not, hey, Vertical's kingdom come. That's right. You know, it's not Philip or Ron's kingdom come. It's right. not Caroline's kingdom come. It's all of us coming together going, Lord Jesus, your kingdom come, kingdom. Father, come. And, and we should all be moving in that same direction together. And like you said, you know, it's not that we agree theologically on every single mm -hmm. point, but... Mm -hmm. What matters is Jesus, and when people may go, well, that's, of course you mean that, but, but generally think about that. Some of the things we don't agree on theologically here or there with people are not what save us. That's exactly right. The one and only thing and person that saves us is Jesus and a relationship with Jesus. Amen. And so if we can agree on that, we understand we're, we're on the same side then. Yes. You know, some of the other doctrinal beliefs that we, you know, sometimes elevate as, as really important, they're not what save us. They're important because they're from the Bible, and we should definitely discuss those. But we always have to remember as a body of believers, who really saves us? Amen. It's not our theolo theological beliefs or beliefs. It's strictly Jesus and the price that he paid on the cross and coming out of that tomb. You know, that's that's our unifying factor because without him, all the other theological beliefs don't matter. That's right. You know, they fall apart if Jesus is not who he says he is. That's exactly right. And so th that's why I encourage you. It's so important because... It also helps us keep the main thing the main thing, which yes. is Jesus. Amen. Well, I get excited about that. But, you, know, you know, when I see somebody of a different denomination, and, you know, we're a non-denominational church, but if I see somebody of a denominational church, and the first thing I think about when I see them is, what do you believe? First thing I think about is, hey, there's a brother or sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to hug them, and everybody knows me as a hugger and a kisser. But, but, there's, but I, I just want to talk about Jesus. And I, I find a common spirit, and because it's Jesus, uh, he's the tie that binds us together, and the blood that ties us together and makes us one. And uh, so um, uh, I don't think um, that, uh, you know, we've spent enough time, in times past in my generation, uh, churches, denominations spent a lot of time throwing rocks at each other. But I think they discovered the fruit of that, uh, bore nothing. But, th but today, 
uh, the unity can result in other people looking at the church and saying, wow, they've got something this world needs, and that's love and Amen. unity, and, uh, and they'll see Jesus in that. Well, I mean, that's Jesus even told us that. He said, they'll yep. know you're my disciples. That's right. By your love. Yep. And so, I mean, it's shocking right there. The Word of God's alive and active. We just applied it right there to that moment and, yep. and what we're trying to do as a church. So, yeah, it's not something that we're just trying to sound, say to sound, you know, nice or anything like that. We genuinely believe, according to Scripture, mm -hmm. that not only should there be unity inside of our church, but there should be unity outside of believers. Amen. So, you know, if, you, if you're listening right now, I would also encourage you, you know, pray for those people as you drive by, those yes. church handling. But even if, if the Lord lays on your heart, go write them a letter. Send, yeah. send them an email, their, their pastor, or, you know, just encourage them. Um, because, man, it would, as a pastor, I can tell you, it, it would be really cool and unique to see someone from a different church just go, hey, I'm just praying for your church. Amen. I'm praying that there's unity inside of your church. I'm praying that God blesses your church. Yep. And why don't we just do that for other churches? You know, if you're listening to podcasts, just... Go pick another church and just write them a nice letter encouraging their pastor and their team that you're praying for unity inside their church mm -hmm. uh, and that their church will accomplish all the great things that God wants to do in and through them. And uh, let's just go be a blessing to, uh, to other people and encourage them, uh, and especially in time when a lot of pastors can be discouraged. Oh, my. Well, you know, if, if I can add one thing to it, you, you know, you made me think about um, if I'm walking through the house and, uh, and I, ac I accidentally stub my toe, but the first thing that happens is my eye goes to it, and uh, then my foot comes up in my hand, uh, reaches down, grabs my foot, and I'm hopping on one leg, so the other leg bears all the uh, burden of the weight. But what's happened is the body uh, draws its full attention to that which is hurting. And um, what a wonderful thing to know that if we were hurting, a member of another church, another body, would be looking, let's say, Father, you know, bless them. Mm -hmm. Or if we're rejoicing, they'll say, hey, Father, we're with them, we're rejoicing with them, but that we can do the same thing for them. And and I love the, the fact that that Jesus compared us to a body because it's a living thing of whom he's the head. And uh, anyway. Like, I, I totally agree because, I mean, the statistic that we last saw was over 50% of Union County is unchurched. Mm. So, I mean, it, it, you know, I think that's where we have to look at each other's other church and go, my goodness, they're the... As the Bible said, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the work is few. So we should band together with what workers Amen. we have and go, there's the whole other half of this county that isn't following Jesus as far as we know. And let's work together to try to, to, to rectify that problem, to go change that. Yes. You know, I mean, how cool would it be wrong? We come back five years from now, we said something like, my goodness, 75% of Union County is churched. You know, wow. we, we, you know we've eradicated half the problem. And, wow. and that's only going to happen by working with other churches. Yeah. You know, we can't. Uh, you know, go vertical, can solve that 50% problem all on our own. Like, that's just not realistic, and, and ours isn't healthy. You know, that's that's pretty egotistical and prideful. So let's just remember to be praying for other okay. churches. Let's work together and do okay. what God's called us to. Um, and so that kind of, we talked a little bit about it. We want to talk about the last value, and the mm -hmm. last value is we love carbs. And uh, <laughs> we wanted to make this one, a, 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 you know, a little clever and, and cheeky because if anyone remembers one of the values we wanted it to be the one about jesus yeah. you know if someone came up to you and say ron like tell me one value about your church hopefully you would go we love carbs yeah. and they go what and you go, well jesus is the bread of life and if nothing else it helps you obviously share the gospel in a very quick and easy manner because they just ask you a question why, yeah. why does your church love carbs yeah we believe we believe jesus is the bread of life and that he is the one who can satisfy every spiritual you know, hunger inside of you. And so when you see that as a value, I think sometimes our temptation as a Christian, if you've been going to church a long time, is just nod your head and go, yeah, yeah, Jesus is important. But what a what a disappointment that is where it is. Because if, if we are a church, if we ever lose our passion and zeal for Jesus, mm -hmm. we're probably a dead church. Yeah. And so when you kind of hear that value as someone who, who didn't know that was coming out, you know, every week, you know, people that didn't know what values were going to reveal when you're sitting out there, what's kind of your response to, to that value? You know, uh, um, from a practical sense, I think of it like this. Um, when I think of Jesus being the bread of life, uh, I think about when you walk into a bakery and you smell... Uh, or somebody's home, you, f you smell a freshly baked loaf of bread. And what it does is it, it, it's, it makes you want to, it just, it's something you just kind of close your eyes and you think, oh, that's just going to be good. 
And then what you do is you try to find that you'll go look in the oven and see what it looks like. And then uh, you just think about, boy, I can't wait till I get a bite of that bread. And what it does, it's appealing to the senses. You find it uh, refreshing. You find it something that you look forward to, something you're going to be able to taste, and you're going to uh, get the joy of tasting something warm and uh, very tasty. And um, and I find Jesus is the same way, um, that when he's real in your life, and, uh, and hopefully when others can see that he's real in our life, that he will be like an aroma that he will be just like freshly baked bread that you uh, smell and it's something that's inviting you to come and partake of, if that makes sense. Yes. And uh, where you can come and say, you know, everything, you, you put everything else aside and you just want to save for the moment. And, uh, and I think that uh, the time we spend with Jesus is like that because he can satisfy the soul where nothing uh, that is tangible can satisfy. Uh, you know, the scripture tells us, this, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or in other words, to me, what he's saying is there's nothing in this world. It's not just a matter of going to heaven, but there, there, there is nothing in this world that can satisfy the soul outside of Jesus. And it's interesting, again, when you go take a bite of that freshly baked bread, that's all you're thinking about. You're just thinking about, oh, this is good. This is so mm. good. And then that's, if that makes any sense. It makes a ton of sense as someone who loves bread. That that really <laughs> registers with me. <laughs> you know, like I always joke about, I mean, Olive Garden, I didn't even know they served entrees at the beginning because I was just there for the breadsticks, you know. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the restaurants I go to, they bring out bread, and I'm like, I'm, I don't even know what I'm gonna get here, but I'm, I'm just proud of you as a restaurant for bringing me bread. <laughs> Very excited about this moment. <laughs> and uh, I think we should be that spiritually. You know, yeah. when we realize as Christians, my goodness, Jesus is the answer. He's the one who can satisfy yeah. the spiritual desires that everyone has, and they don't even know it. You know, mm -hmm. and I think the world has been craving to meet needs in so many ways, whether it's you know alcohol or drugs or you know, sexual things or pornography or whatever they're trying to reach out and fill this void. And it's this constant feeling of probably like you're a hamster on a wheel or just going, going and never quite being satisfied because it, it just wears off. Yeah. You know, Jesus is going, no, 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 no. I don't wear off. Yeah. And, and I can be fulfilling on this side of eternity and next. Amen. And so we want to be very clear that we believe that as a church, but also be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I love this one. I thought it was, you know, very clever, and, and I hope it sticks with people because we love for what we do to have be a conversational piece with people. Because, again, we want to go out and engage people in the community uh, with conversation about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And and we don't have to change anyone's life, but, man, if we can talk about Jesus, you know, and you open that door and let him just do what only he can do, Yeah, we want to see that happen. And, you know, to the hungry soul, that's hurting that's that's really hungry and 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 they tried everything like you said pornography alcohol drugs uh uh maybe been married multiple times and they have found that that's not uh that's that it just hasn't worked that that bread of life jesus is that one thing that can bring um uh, the satisfaction as he said blessed for those who hunger for they shall not hunger anymore and um, uh, and he is that bread of life yeah and maybe you're sitting out there thinking man like you know i've gone to church and i don't know that i've had that experience since i don't know that i would say jesus has satisfied every desire and man, what i would encourage you to do is have you really given him that opportunity mm -hmm. you know, how, how would you how would you say yeah i've been in the word every day i prayed every day but with the intention of when i do that god speak to me i'm not just reading it through like it's a book or i'm just not jump through some hoops in prayer. Yeah. Would you say you really are living your life in a way that God goes, you know, this is the way Jesus wants me to live. I'm going to follow his teachings, and I'm going to ask him to speak in my life and meet those needs in that way that only he can, and mm -hmm. giving him the space and opportunity to do so. Yeah. You know, I think as humans, sometimes we kind of half-heart Christianity, and I can tell you there's no half-heartedness in follow Jesus in Scripture. Amen. And so... If you really want that experience with Jesus, it's not by following a certain amount of rules. It's not, you know, trying to be good enough. It's actually just submitting to Jesus and go, Jesus, wow, I need you to work in and through me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do the things you ask me to do. And then just give Jesus the space. Amen. 
And so I, I would encourage you, if you're a listener, if you haven't quite had this experience with Jesus and you kind of hear Ron talking, you're like, I, I don't know that that's true. I would encourage you just take it day by day. Mm-hmm. Go be in the Word and ask, like what we talked about earlier, just ask the Lord to speak in your life through this, reveal things to you. Um, and then also, it, we talked about being you know, part of a body unit. Get around some other people who love Jesus. Amen. You know, Don't follow Jesus on your own. It's never meant to be in isolation. Um, and then thirdly, live your life in a way that helps you focus on Jesus. Amen. You know, I think some of the times we treat Jesus like uh, a side hustle or part-time job or anything. It's not everything that we are. Yeah. And until Jesus gets that kind of attention and focus, I don't know how anyone can expect to have a relationship with him where he's satisfying every desire because we're looking for answers elsewhere. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, to me what that says is we as people, uh, before we knew the Lord and for those who are only half serving him, uh, Jesus didn't come for us to, to for us to include him in our lives, Amen. but he came to be our life. And what's interesting is when all the things of life go awry and our life doesn't line up with the way we thought it should work out, well, we're not living for life. We're living for Jesus, who is our life. And uh, that way we just don't include him into our life. But, uh, but when he is our life and he's the Lord of our life, then when life goes awry, we still haven't lost our purpose and our first love. And it gives us the motivation to keep on. Amen. Absolutely. So, Ron, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. We appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you listening to the podcast right now. If, if you have enjoyed the content, we encourage you to, to like it, you know, share it, subscribe to it. Uh, that would be a huge blessing to us. Leave it a five-star review or, because I was on here today, four-star review, whatever you want. Uh, and so really appreciate it. And then also shout out to Caroline behind the cameras, Amen. helping us with everything technology wise. Amen. Goodness knows Ron and I were not going to be able to figure any of that out. <laughs> That's the honest truth. Um, and then also thank you to Austin Watson in Chicago for editing it. And, uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time on the podcast. Amen.